Okay, so uh, yes, I'll, I'll talk about the computational complexity uh, of estimating uh, uh, time to convergence. And um, this is work with Andrei Bogdanov and Elhanan uh, Maso. Um, so, so maybe this, the, the, the theme of this talk is a little bit uh, contrary to, to, to other talks because we're talking about you know, hardness uh, results. Um, so, so the motivation is uh, that MCMC is uh, uh, widely used in practice um, uh, in doing inference uh, uh, and in various applications uh, such as image processing and so on. Um, and we know that, you know, the theory tells us that eventually the chain will converge to uh, your desired distribution. But uh, in practice, you may or may not have uh, bounds on the mixing time. And uh, even when you do have bounds, uh, uh, they may not be practical at all to, to simulate for, for that long. Uh, so so uh, people who actually code Markov chains and, and run them, they uh, want to be able to tell, well, are the samples that I'm getting, uh, are, are they you know, good for doing inference with? Um, and in practice, they use uh, a number of statistical tests, which are called uh, convergence diagnostics. So, um, so I'll just uh, quickly say that you know this, the setup again is going to be uh, that we're looking at a Markov chain uh, M on some finite space omega, and uh, it has transition matrix P and uh, stationary distribution pi, and um, we're we're looking at uh, um, the the epsilon mixing time, which is defined as uh, the first time t where this distance dt goes uh, below epsilon, and dt is uh, the total variation distance between the t-step uh, starting uh, t-step distributions uh, for a worst pair of states. Um, and we'll also look at uh, uh, the mixing time when you start from a particular state and look at the first time that the total variation distance between the t-step distribution and uh, pi is less than epsilon. So, um, so coming back to these uh, convergence diagnostics, um, here's, uh, so I mentioned some, some visual uh, diagnostics that people use. So here's a really common one uh, called uh, the trace plot. And uh, what, what is happening here is that you look at, uh, you know, some, some particular dimension of your, uh, uh, you know, Markov chain configuration, um, or maybe some feature. And uh, you're, you're, on the x-axis, you're plotting the iteration number, and you're plotting the value at uh, the iteration. You're just uh, seeing uh, this, this plot versus time. Uh, and if you go to uh, something like uh, uh, the statistical analysis software, the user's guide to assessing Markov chain convergence, uh, they have these pictures, and they tell you, well, if you see something like the top left picture where uh, uh, you know, the, the mean seems to be fairly constant and, um, and you're also varying fairly constantly uh, around the mean, then that's, that's a good thing. Um, uh, and uh, you know, in, in this picture here, uh, you see that you might want to throw away some of the, the iterations in the beginning, but then it seems like uh, um, you're, you're back to the first picture. And the bottom two pictures are, are bad. Um, this one uh, doesn't seem to have uh, a constant mean at all. And that one, this picture, uh, things seem to be moving uh, sort of fairly slowly around the mean. OK, so, um, so that, that is uh, one very commonly used uh, 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 diagnostic. And of course, you know, we, we uh, understand that uh, while seeing a picture like this might be necessary for convergence, uh, it's, it's not sufficient. And it's probably easy to cook up examples where, um, uh, where it's not uh, sufficient. So, so, I mean, you might at least think that picture two is a bit better than picture one in some sense. I mean, it looks like something, something happened. happened. Right. Yes. <laughs> Maybe picture one is just the first tiny little bit of picture two. Sure. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, uh, I think they say something like, um, uh, I think they say that here the convergence is pretty fast. And, and uh, <laughs> uh, 
you know, right away things things are looking uh, quite good. But um, but you know, I, I don't think that that they are unaware of the fact that uh, uh, you know these um, are not uh, conclusive. That they don't you know conclusively tell you that you have converged. Um, okay. And then, you know, they, uh, in addition to these visual sort of tests, uh, there, there are a number of uh, statistical tests that people have come up with. One very common one is this, this first uh, Gelman-Rubin uh, uh, test, where you're running uh, multiple copies of your Markov chain from uh, uh, different starting points and uh, comparing, um, you know, how, how much your observable is varying within the chains to how much is uh, uh, the variance between the copies of the chain and, and things of that sort. Um, and the idea being that you know, if you have some very multimodal distribution, then maybe uh, if you had a way of taking multiple starting points from the different modes, then uh, um, you know, that, would get, that would at least uh, uh, overcome the problem of not seeing a mode at all. Um, OK, so, uh, so, so as I said, you know, they're not unaware that, that diagnostics can fail in various scenarios. Um, so what we wanted to do in this work was maybe abstract out uh, what exactly does it mean to, to diagnose whether convergence has occurred. Uh, can we just frame this as a computational problem and understand how, how hard it is? Um, and uh, you know, the, other, the other thing uh, maybe is that you will see various papers where, where somebody will say, well, look, this, this diagnostic, it, it actually fails to, to show you that there is non-convergence, but here I've come up with this other diagnostic and, and this will detect uh, non-convergence. So how can we put um, sort of, uh, how can we frame the problem of convergence with uh, uh, as many uh, restrictions as possible and still show that this is a hard thing? So, uh, okay, so what we start with uh, saying is that um, a Markov chain is going to be a rule uh, for determining the next state given uh, the state right now, which is a string uh, um, of length n, um, just a 0, 1 string of length n, uh, and some randomness. So we'll say that a circuit uh, of this type specifies the transition matrix P if your probability that the circuit outputs uh, the state Y um, uh, given x and the randomness is exactly equal to the transition probability. Um, okay, so, so this is the Markov chain, and what should a diagnostic algorithm do? Well, it should have access to this circuit for simulating the chain, and you might want to allow it to simulate the chain for some time t, and then ask it to decide uh, at time t, is uh, the chain within one quarter total variation distance, or are you still at least uh, one quarter um, in total variation distance away from pi? Um, so, so that's the first attempt. And one, one thing to note about uh, this is that uh, you're asking for something pretty stringent. You're asking uh, it to tell you kind of at time t you know, exactly what, what the distance is. So you might want to relax this a little bit. And um, you, could, you could do the following. You could say, well, I just want an algorithm which tells me um, at time t, if the uh, uh, variation distance is below an eighth, I say mixed. And if it's uh, still at least a half, I say not mixed. And in the other cases, I'm allowed to make a mistake. So you're allowing some sort of gap in, in your approximation to the distance. Um, you could go even further and say, uh, well, I will say mixed if uh, I'm below an eighth at time t. But if I run for some constant c times t, c can be big, um, and still I'm uh, half away from uh, stationarity, then I, I say not mixed. OK, uh, okay. so, so this, this, is, this last is the, the formulation that we'll look at. Um, so here are uh, three versions of the problem that, uh, that we thought might be interesting to look at. So the first one, uh, test convergence with two parameters, C and delta, uh, is kind of the most, uh, most general uh, version where you have very little information on what the chain is doing. So your input to this problem is the circuit C, um, a starting state x, and a time t that you want to run for. 
And uh, the only thing you're told is that uh, peas are gothic. Um, and then you'd like to say, uh, uh, yes, you know, at time t, I'm uh, uh, below a quarter minus delta. And, uh, or in the other case, if I've run for c times t, I'm still uh, above a quarter plus delta. Um, so, so one thing that's, that's maybe missing here is that um, you know, we haven't said anything about uh, cases where you actually have a bound on uh, the mixing time. And um, so to, to encode that, we have this second version of the problem, so this poly test convergence, uh, where the input is now your circuit for simulating the chain, uh, your time t, and um, t max, which is some bound on the mixing time. And what you'd like the algorithm to do is run in time that's polynomial in this bound on the mixing time. And the way, the way you've encoded that is, is by uh, giving the input. Uh, to okay, so again, we want to uh, um, you know, distinguish these two cases. And uh, one thing that, that we haven't done here is taken an initial starting state. So we've just said uh, you're at an arbitrary starting state, and you want to, to distinguish these two cases. But you could also say, um, suppose I also know the starting state, which is true in, in uh, many cases in practice. Um, you know, people are choosing their starting states sometimes cleverly and, and saying, uh, can I diagnose uh, convergence? So, so that's this third problem, um, polynomial testing convergence with some initial state, uh, which is x in the input. Uh, OK, and then you want to distinguish these two cases, the, the total variation distance to stationarity started at x. Uh, OK, so, um, so I'm just going to sort of go through um, the results that we know about these, these three problems and uh, maybe tell you a little bit about uh, how, you, how you show them. All right, so, so our first problem is the most general one. And this turns out to be uh, uh, doable in p-space and um, also p-space hard. So, so maybe that's uh, not too surprising. But in, in any case, so if you haven't seen uh, p-space before, uh, it's, um, or don't remember it, it's the set of all decision problems uh, which a Turing machine can decide using a polynomial amount of space uh, in, in the input. Um, OK, so, so what I'll tell you about is showing the second <coughs> part of the result, which is uh, that the problem is p-space hard. And so if you think about what you need to do to show p-space hardness, uh, you would like to take a p-space hard problem and uh, reduce from it to uh, some instance of this testing convergence problem. Right? And what you'd like to be able to do is, uh, uh, when you have an input to your p-space complete problem, uh, which is, uh, say, a yes, then you'd like um, the mixing time maybe to be small. And uh, when it's a no instance, then you'd like the mixing time to be large. So you want to sort of cook up uh, an example like this. Uh, OK, so, so here is uh, what we can do. Um, so, so start with some p-space complete problem. Let's call it A. And I'm going to draw here the, the computation graph uh, of the Turing machine TA, which decides it. So, um, so again, just, just as a reminder, um, what is your Turing machine doing? It's got uh, some, some tape that it's uh, going over. And it has some state uh, at each time. And it reads a bit and looks at its state. So there's some finite number of states. That, that the machine can be in. It reads the bit here. The state tells it uh, what to write and whether to move left or right. Okay, so, so these, these nodes in the computation graph, they encode a configuration, which is what's on the tape, what is the state of the machine, and where is it pointing. Okay, so, um, so what's going to happen is that out of each node, you have uh, one, one edge coming out, um, because you, you sort of know where to go next. And um, we'll look at two, two uh, no, three uh, uh, special, special nodes. 
So this one is the accept state, this one is the reject state, and um, this orange one corresponds to uh, the starting configuration for a particular input. Um, okay, so, uh, so for example, this corresponds to an input uh, on which the Turing machine accepts because you see that there's this path to the accept node. So here is the reduction. Um, out of this, we, we construct a Markov chain uh, as follows. So the, the states of the Markov chain are just the configurations of the Turing machine. And we're going to get rid of the directions. And um, for each uh, edge, uh, which you see in the configuration graph, you put in uh, one of these pink edges and have to make it have weight w, and uh, put a, put a self-loop at uh, each node. And then you connect this accept state with the reject state with a with a edge of weight one, um, and lastly you connect the reject state with the start state uh, with an edge of weight w also. Um, and this turns out to be enough uh, if you choose w carefully uh, to be able to distinguish the yes and no cases. And and you can sort of see uh, from the picture why because suppose you're in the yes case. And there is a path from S to A, so they're in the same component. Um, so you see that you know, in, in, in this uh, graph, somehow it seems to be fairly easy to get from A to S. Uh, but if you think about what might happen in the no case when S is uh, not in the same component as A, then um, you know, in order to get from S to A, you would have to go through this uh, uh, edge of weight one, um, and, and you'd like to make that sort of a, a lightweight edge compared to W. Okay, so, so the idea is fairly, fairly straightforward. Um, the only things that you need to be careful about are kind of the exact settings of the, the parameters. For example, um, you've actually got to choose this weight W so that your reduction is in polynomial time, which is something that, that you need to do for p-space reductions, for example. Uh, okay, so 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 here's a little bit uh, of um, of argument, you know, why you can do that. So uh, so we first look at the yes case, and you observe um, that well, not just in the yes case, but in general, um, each state of the Markov chain uh, has some constant degree, right? And this is because um, you know the out degrees in this graph are one and the in degree is something constant because there's a constant number of states of the machine. Okay, so let's call that uh, bound on the degree D. Uh, and so we're going to say that the mixing time is upper bounded in terms of uh, the, the uh, inverse square of the conductance and uh, we'll put a, put a lower bound on the conductance here. So um, if you want to lower bound the conductance, you notice that if you take any subset of the vertices here, there's always a, a W weight edge coming out of it. Okay. Um, and moreover, you can upper bound um, the, the total weight of edges inside the set um, by uh, D times to the N times the, the weight of the edges. Okay, so your conductance is lower bounded by this quantity. You can also get a lower bound on the minimum uh, stationary probability, because the stationary probability is just proportional to the, the edge weights uh, going into a vertex. Okay, so putting all that together gives you that you have an upper bound on the mixing time of uh, something like d cube um, two to the power three n. Okay, so what you'd like to show is that in the no case, you will get a significantly uh, uh, larger mixing time uh, if you choose W uh, appropriately. So, so how can you argue about the lower bound? You say, well, um, suppose that I start uh, uh, two copies of this chain on, on the graph. Uh, let's say XT starts at S and YT starts at the vertex A. Then um, what is the, the, the distance between the T-step distributions of XT and YT? at time t, well, uh, you can lower bound it by the probability that uh, xt uh, hasn't reached this component, 
minus the chance that there's a time t where uh, uh, there's a time t prime where y t prime has gone over into the component of s. Okay, and um, you know you can see that because of, of the loops, the the chance of leaving the components uh, in any step is at most one over w. So a union bound will give you that uh, the distance at time t is at least one minus two t over w. Okay, and this this lets us compute that um, in order to get uh, within one quarter plus delta uh, uh, variation distance, uh, you would need to go for time w over four. Okay. All right. So, uh, so all we need to do now is set w to be large enough. So I've taken it to be, you know, the the the, the sort of stretching factor c in the time, um, the upper bound from the yes case, and times. Uh, uh, some constants that we need. And uh, to finish the reduction, take your starting state to be s, and uh, the time that you, you will run for to be the upper bound on, on the yes case. And so so this, this will finish the reduction. So, uh, so that piece of it is hard. Um, yeah. It's OK to choose w that large. For right. Long. That's right. So, so, it's, so you see. Um, it's OK to choose w to be this large because you have a polynomial time. So you need to be able to compute this uh, uh, in polynomial time. Right? So, so your circuit has to be able to say, take an edge of weight w or an edge of weight 1, essentially. And uh, uh, since w can be represented with polynomial many bits, that's, that, that works. Uh, OK. Uh, all right. So, so the next uh, the next problem was uh, when we have a bound on the mixing time, uh, and in this case, what we show is that um, assuming some bound on on this uh, the, on this stretch in the time that that you look at, um, the problem is Cohen p hard. Um, so, so the proof is through you know another another one of these reductions from a Cohen p complete problem, and. Um, Maybe I'll just say quickly what it is. So, so the reduction is from unsatisfiability, uh, which means that if your input is a formula psi, uh, a CNF formula psi, then uh, uh, if it doesn't have any satisfying assignments, then you are uh, then you are you know unsatisfiable. Okay. So, so the reduction is the following. You think of your formula as represented by the vertices of the Boolean cube. And um, the Markov chain is going to be defined by taking weight 1 on all the edges of the cube uh, and the following uh, thing. So whenever you have a vertex of the cube corresponding to uh, an unsatisfying assignment, put a subloop of weight n. And when you have um, a vertex corresponding to a satisfying assignment, you put uh, a loop of weight n to the d, where d will be some constant that we decide bigger than 1. So you're, you're sort of slowing down with self-loops the chain at these satisfying uh, uh, assignments. OK, so what is the point? The point is that if you start out with a formula that is uh, um, unsatisfiable, then this is just uh, you know, the, the lazy random walk on the cube, because uh, you, you've got half probability of staying and half of moving to a, a random node. Uh, and so you can upper bound your mixing time by um, by a constant that depends on delta times n log n. On the other hand, uh, if you think about what happens here, then again you can make the same sort of argument that you can lower bound the, the distance at time t for two copies of the chain because you could start with one of the satisfying assignments and you could start with um, uh, the, the vertex which is diagonally opposite to it. And the point being that um, you can bound the distance between the t-step distributions by saying, well, uh, uh, you know, what's the probability that this guy stays here for, for time t and doesn't leave it? And at the same time, what is the chance of this, this copy of the chain going and hitting uh, it during that time? It will be exponentially small. OK, so, um, okay, so, so, so maybe I will. Uh, uh, no. 
the, the calculations, but, but the idea is very similar that um, uh, we can show this gap in the, the mixing time in these two cases. Uh, okay, so, so the last problem is uh, we have a bound on the mixing time and some particular uh, starting state. So in fact, if you look at the, the reduction uh, that we did in, in the last, in the second problem, um, you can you can actually uh, uh, no. Okay, so um, so the result that that we have here is the following. Um, so the hardness is is this second piece, and it says that if your stretching is bounded by t max over t uh, times some constant, then um, this, this PTCS should just be polytest con initial, uh, then that is uh, SZK hard. So what is SZK? It stands for statistical zero knowledge. So it turns out um, that, that this particular complexity class, which is studied by uh, uh, people in cryptography, um, sort of captures the hardness of, of this problem. So, so where does this come from? Uh, so it comes from this uh, idea of having proof systems uh, in, in complexity. And um, the way it goes is that, say you have a language L uh, uh, that you're trying to decide. So a proof system, um, so a proof system consists of uh, an algorithm V, uh, which has uh, uh, the following properties. So if you give it a string x, which is in the language, then there is some proof pi, so that you can you can give pi to v, and v will output accept. Um, and on the other hand, if x is not in the language, then any proof that you give it uh, uh, doesn't uh, yep. cause it to accept. It will output reject. And you'd like v to run in time that's polynomial in x. And um, so, you, so this is sort of another way that, that the class NP is, is also defined. And, and you can see uh, you know, the familiar sort of case of SAT, where, where the proof is just the satisfying assignment. Um, so the question you can ask about this is, uh, you know, when, when I give you a satisfying assignment to convince you that the formula is satisfiable, how much knowledge are you gaining from uh, uh, verifying that it is an assignment. Um, so for example, you know, at, at this, it's not a formal thing, but at some level, uh, for example, you gain the ability to convince someone else that the formula is a satisfying assignment. Right? You can take this assignment and give it to someone else and, and, and convince them. So you could say somehow that, um, that you know something else about uh, the problem besides the fact that the formula is satisfiable. So people wanted to come up with uh, uh, proof systems where you don't have sort of this leaking of information. Um, so Goldwasser, Mikali, and Rakoff uh, defined uh, uh, this notion of zero knowledge proofs, where now you have a prover P, and they're trying to convince a verifier V of some assertion. And V learns nothing but the truth of, of the assertion. So if you're seeing this for the first time, it's kind of surprising that uh, I think I think it's surprising that that such things can can exist. Um, and then again, you have the same uh, uh, types of requirements uh, from this interaction between the prover and verifier. So you want completeness, uh, so that if the string is in the language, then V accepts it after seeing you know the interaction between the prover and the verifier with some probability uh, better than two-thirds. Uh, so I didn't say, but the prover and verifier are allowed to now toss coins. Um, you have soundness. So if x is not in the language, um, then for anything that the prover tells you, um, v would only accept with bounded probability. And the verifier is efficient. So where does zero knowledge come in? Um, so the way of, of defining zero knowledge is to say, that the entire interaction could have been simulated by the verifier. Okay. So, so meaning that, um, so, so somehow this captures the fact that V is not learning anything outside the, 
the truth of the assertion. Um, okay, so I won't you know go into formally what what uh, how that's done, but um, you can then talk about statistical zero knowledge or SZK, which is the class of languages where there's an interaction between the prover and the verifier that's statistically indistinguishable from the simulator uh, uh, with zero knowledge that the verifier uh, uh, could run. And um, you know, the, the point being that this is in contrast to things like computational zero knowledge, where the verifier is uh, uh, restricted to be, uh, where, where the verifier you know, has to be computationally bounded. Um, so, so maybe I should mention that um, you know, one idea is that when you're having this uh, leaking of information, you could think of verifiers who are, who are not honest, who are not you know, running the protocol uh, uh, for, for uh, deciding this problem. Uh, rather, you know, they could cheat and try to gain some extra information from the prover. Okay? So, so that's why there are these restrictions of, of statistical and uh, computational. Uh, on the verifier. OK, so, so in any case, um, the canonical hard problem for this class SCK uh, is a statistical difference. And um, so, so it's quite simple to state. You have an input, uh, which is two circuits, C and C prime. And they are outputting distributions mu1 and mu2 over uh, 0, 1 to the n. And in the yes instances, uh, uh, the circuits are outputting distributions which are, have uh, total variation distance, which is at least uh, a parameter C. And in the no instances, the distributions are close together. There's an upper bound on the, on the total variation distance. Um, so Sahai and Vadan uh, uh, showed that as long as there's some gap between this completeness parameter and the soundness parameter, the problem statistical difference uh, is in the class SZK. So there is a statistical zero knowledge protocol for uh, this problem. Um, and uh, for any, any values of the parameters uh, uh, S and C, the problem is hard for SZK. Uh, and, and one note about SZK is that it's believed to contain problems um, uh, sorry, it contains problems that are believed to be hard, such as graph non-isomorphism, uh, but, but it is believed that it doesn't contain NP-complete problems. Yeah. Sorry, you might have said this. Um, the cir these circuits are outputting distributions. Is that like yours, where they're giving you the next step of a Markov chain, or do they have random gates? Uh, no, no. So, so you just think of um, the distribution over 0, 1 to the n that is uh, uh, being output by this circuit. So the circuit... Uh, well, uh, so so I have a circuit and I'm putting inputs into it, and then I'm just getting some distribution over the Boolean cube because. The inputs are random. Oh, the inputs are random. Thanks. All right. So so. So once we have this uh, complete problem, it kind of uh, we don't have to bother with. Um, essentially don't have to bother with uh, zero knowledge protocols and so on if we want to show hardness at least because we just want to take an instance of this uh, statistical difference problem and reduce it to our problem. Um, so we take uh, this input which is two circuits C and C prime and we'll take settings of the parameters where C is equal to one and S is a quarter minus uh, delta. And the idea for constructing uh, the Markov chain in this case is, is the following. So I'm going to construct a Markov chain on the product space of uh, uh, capital M hypercubes. Uh, this. Uh, OK. This is M um, guys like this. Uh, and uh, so, so the way the way the transitions of the chain work are, you choose you're at some state y t z t, which is a pair uh, in in uh, you know m, and some some point uh, in the hypercube. If you happen to be at the the first point of m, 
then you're going to choose the next point in the hypercube according to mu1. And if you're at the second uh, point, then choose according to mu2. And if you're at any of the other points, uh, you just stay where you are in the hypercube. Okay. So, uh, all right, and then at the next step, you move within m uniformly at random. So you can, if you think about it, uh, you, you find that the stationary distribution of this chain is going to be um, uniform over m in, in this dimension and um, you know, drawn from mu1, the average of mu1 and mu2. Uh, okay. okay, so you can write down uh, fairly exactly um, an expression for the distance to stationarity when you're starting at uh, uh, this, this uh, state. So it's 1 in m, and it's at the point you know, 0, 0, 0 in the hypercube. Um, and basically, the, the variation distance is captured by the variation distance between mu1 and mu2. OK. Um, and and you know, of course, this factor is here because you know, some of the time, m minus 2 over m of the time, you're, you're not really doing anything to, to you know, get closer to the stationary distribution. Uh, OK. So, all right, so, so now in the yes case, Backwards. So, um, so this this should actually read the no case. So in the no case, your total variation distance between mu one and mu two is uh, upper bounded by s, um, and so you can upper bound uh, the, the distance of the t step distribution from stationarity. And on the other hand, um, you can lower bound in the yes case the the t step distribution from stationarity, and as long as the time that you run for is not too large then uh, uh, you would get from here that the distance is at least a quarter plus delta. OK, so, um, so that's uh, sort of how you get this gap uh, in these two cases. And in both cases, you can show that um, the mixing time is, has an upper bound of m. And then that follows just from the fact that uh, uh, this distance would be uh, bounded, and this is no more than 1. Uh, okay, so so that is how you do uh, that that reduction, um, okay, and and so maybe uh, just a few words in conclusion. Uh, so we don't believe that efficient algorithms exist for these classes that we've shown these problems are hard for, um, and you know this this implies that for the particular versions of uh, uh, diagnostic algorithms that we've considered. Um, there shouldn't exist uh, algorithms, efficient algorithms. Um, Don Woodard asked us an interesting question, which was, uh, can you show hardness uh, for diagnosing convergence from a given state, or can you show hardness of diagnosing convergence when you know uh, uh, pi up to some global constant? Because that's often the case in, in the Markov chains that we look at. And so if you, if you look carefully at um, the co-NP reduction, where we don't have a given starting state, um, in that case, the stationary distribution is, is easy, because you know, it's just proportional to either n or n to the d. Right? So, so this could certainly be sort of output efficiently by some circuit. Um, on the other hand, if you think about the SCK reduction, then in order to show hardness uh, in that case, you would need to reduce from some SZK complete problem where uh, um, you know, your distributions mu1 and mu2 are, are somehow known to you. Okay. Um, or, or at least you know, in, in our reduction, uh, that might be helpful. So we don't know how to do that. Um, and then another, another uh, sort of class of uh, algorithms that you might want hardness for uh, are maybe Gibbs samplers. So meaning that you have an efficient way to, con to you know, uh, um, output the conditional distribution of each variable given the ones around it um, and to show hardness. Thank you.
implement this with positive results when you relax even further the requirements for diagnostic, for instance, assume more assumptions on the transition rates, or in particular, you have this T versus CT, but maybe C is not a constant, but allowed to grow. Mm -hmm. change, I want to say, my mixing time is, uh, you know, uh, give, give bounds uh, to distinguish whether the mixing time is bigger than N cubed or less than N crisp. Something like that work. So because people are going to keep using diagnostics whether we tell them not to <laughs> or not. So are there some, then we say, well, your diagnostic can't do as well as you would wish, but, you know, here is uh, some, so some positive results to complement um, all the, you know, I, I like to tell them that they're, that they fa the diagnostic will fail as, almost as much as you do, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but at some point they want yeah, you know, would be good to give them some positive advice. Right. So, um, okay. So, so, so you, well, so in these results, you see it. I see. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a constant, right? Because. Uh, Suppose I have a random walk on a graph, so I know all the transition probabilities are at least one over n. Where so, I mean, you, you obviously your results indicate you need a lot more. You need some stronger assumptions mm -hmm. to have a positive result. But if the probabilities are all, you know, all, all mm -hmm. the transition mm -hmm. probabilities mm -hmm. are not too small, right? Uh, you know, then there will be I some see. positive results. The question is, what? You know, how good can they be? Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's not a direction. So, in the same direction, so that is the problem that you showed SCK hard, is it also contained in SCK? Is it not? Uh, right, so, so if you have the right amount of gap, um, then, then it is contained in. So, it, so um, it's always contained in NP, intersect for NP? Uh, so, I think, so. Um, so, SCK. It's in AM intersect co-AM. It is in AM intersect co-AM, uh, co that's right. And so you would believe that it's in NP intersect co-NP, yeah. Um, so so it's, it's not always. It's, uh, I guess, when you have uh, enough of a gap in the total variation distance. Does that answer your question? Don't you have the last question? No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> you did have the last question. <laughs> 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 uh, it's a bunch of timing.